I'm here with Barand Mons, who's the opening plenary keynote speaker at TNC 2014. And uh, Barand, we're going to start with your main message that you want people to uh, come away from your talk with, which is that basically you're calling for data stewardship to be built into future projects funded by the European Commission, I understand. Um, what do you mean by data stewardship? Well, let me first say not only by the European Commission, because most of the research is still financed from the member states, so also the member states should think about this very carefully. Data stewardship really covers the entire data cycle, and I want to really distinguish it from data management, because data management plans are becoming more and more popular, but they still suggest that by the end of the project, you can let go of the data. And since data are nowadays for the long term, they can be reused by computers and by people to do more research. Really, it is important that they stay on after projects have ended. So data stewardship really also takes into account the long term accessibility and, and reusability of the data. So in other words, kind of looking after it and making sure that uh, it's kept in a way that people can then dip into it in future. Yes, that is what we have now designed as the so-called FAIR principle, uh, findable accessible, interoperable, and reusable. And that is how data should be stored, and then really for humans and computers. So as much as possible, massive data sets that are simply too large for people to look through should really be understandable by computers. Mm -hmm. And uh, you mentioned huge data sets, and that's really what's at the heart of this call, isn't it? The fact that so much data is being produced so quickly now by many areas of science. Yeah, and, and really we start the whole FAIR, fair port principle in the life sciences for that very reason. Uh, we have already significantly more data than the Large Hadron Collider, which was traditionally the big data producer. And scarily enough, the data in the life sciences, especially also for next generation sequencing, sequencing people's genomes, is doubling in six to eight months. And how does that compare months. with the uh, ability of the uh, computer systems to process that and store that? And well, it's far outpacing Moore's law, for sure. So we have to really find very clever ways to deal with this data, not only the storage, but specifically to route them, to bring software to the data. So there is a lot of networking issues there as well, where Terena comes in, obviously, that's clear. You mentioned uh, the Fairport um, initiative, let's say. Could you explain more about that? Yeah, it was a grassroots initiative that we had a Lawrence workshop in Leiden uh, in January this year. We brought 25 people from all over the world together to deal with this. And we came with this uh, approach that we wanted to have a minimal standard for data interoperability uh, globally. And that compares very well with the IP in the internet, you know. so. In the end, we have to find a very simple protocol and standard where all data publishers and data users can adhere to so that everything works with the maximum degree of freedom for the people that actually deal with the applications and publish the data and so on. And we want to do this globally, but it has been picked up very clearly by Elixir, the European uh, uh, project, where it is now an official pilot. So we will drive it both from Europe and the United States, but essentially it's a global initiative. Obviously, mm -hmm. data are global. And uh, as I understand it, the idea is that uh, you need to be able to make connections between data, uh, whether they're in literature or in uh, uh, data sets, to sort of almost like group them together or to be able to fish them out, anything that's related to each other, to make more meaning out of data that's there. Is that yeah. right? Well, if you, if you really simplify e-science, it is pattern recognition in big data. And big data already starts with, indeed, taking everything that was ever put in the literature, in databases, in data sets. And these supplementary data sets are so big now, you cannot read through them as a human. So you essentially have to make them what we now call functionally interlinked. And that also leads to semantic web technology where you link these data rather than trying to reintegrate them into another you know, proprietary format or something that is not interoperable. And then use computers to really analyze those data and then go back into the literature, to databases and all the very valuable resources to then confirm 
that the pattern you saw actually means something biologically or in any other science. And what's the benefit of doing that? And have you got some examples where this approach has already had some results? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, my own research in Leiden with, with our biosemantics group uses this technology to take all the databases that we can lay our hands on and all the literature and then make this huge graph. And then we see patterns in the graph and we predict new protein-protein interactions, new diseases for uh, new genes that are associated with diseases. And now also increasingly we go into the drug area where we have this uh, open facts project, a major project from the IMI, the Innovative Medicines Initiative, which really is a project we are very proud of. It started uh, three years ago. It's now been prolonged for a little while. And uh, that's where I go tomorrow. That's why I have to leave early. And uh, basically it took the semantic web technology, which was really very nerdy until not so long ago, into something that is now mainstream in the sense that 22 Pharma are collaborating in IMI and many of them are now looking at open facts to, to do their joint functionally interlinking of data. And it, it works. I mean, of course, it's far from being mature and, and ideal, but it starts to work and it shows already enormous benefits, speeding up research uh, very strongly, answering complicated questions much more quickly, mm. and that helps everyone. So it's a really uh, exciting period, actually. So as a final question then, uh, aside from building data stewardship in, into any projects, that may be submitted in future <laughs> calls by uh, members of the research and education networking community. Can you suggest any other uh, areas in, or ways in which this community can help? Well, I mean, let's say uh, two words about this 5% mantra, as I always call it. Uh, if you would really look at 5% of all research going into this very important market of data stewardship, uh, if Nelly Cruz says it's data is the new oil, then my question is why don't we have oil piping? Why don't we have a market to trade oil? Because data cannot be cited. Nowadays, people are still looking at old-fashioned articles only. And articles are very much needed as confirmational reading material, how the experiment was done and so on. But the real data is where the research will take place largely, and specifically by computers. Now, it's very obvious that if you look at 5% of the total, well, you know the total amount of Horizon 2020, and you know that's about five or so percent of what the member state spends, and that's again probably a, f a quarter of what the world spends. So there is a huge new market for data, but the piping, the networking is not ready, and there is no way to award people for sharing data, and those are the major hurdles left. So we have to work very closely with the content communities, the, uh, the data-specific communities like life sciences or environment or humanities and Terena and other organizations to make sure that the infrastructure is there to root data, but also to bring software to data that may be not allowed to leave the hospital because they are patient-related or whatever. There's a lot of authentication issues. There is a lot of hard core networking issues where we have to work very closely together. And many of these things are generic, but some of them are also very specific to certain areas. So Terena also needs connections, I think, to all the specific science areas to see what their specific needs might be. Great. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Lovely. Thank you.